Welcome to The House of David with Pastor Scott Vallee, a Holy Impact Ministries.com production where we test the scripture, contend for the faith, and stand for the truth. And now, here's your host, Pastor Scott Vallee. Hello and welcome to the House of David radio program, a Holy Impact Ministries.com production. I'm Pastor Scott Villain, and I'd, I'll be your host this evening as we dive into our Father's Torah this evening in order to better understand how, when, and why our Father in Heaven chose to implement his Levitical law and the commandments found in his Torah. This is going to be an interesting uh, study, I think, uh, for everybody this evening. So I'm glad you're here. I hope that you have your uh, highlighters with you and your your Bibles and your pens and uh, everything like that, because uh, we're going to need them today. Uh, I'm going to go through a lot of different scriptures uh, here this evening. So you might want to have your pens with you and uh, all that uh, and, a, and a tablet, maybe even just to kind of jot some of these things down, because we're not going to... Um, go through and read each and every single scripture because this uh, particular study is going to be so lengthy. So uh, again, I hope you have your pens and your paper there, a tablet, uh, your Bibles with you because we're going to go through a lot of material. So uh, with that being said, I just wanted to uh, let everybody know that uh, we did baptize Brother Mark uh, yesterday uh, and Brother Gary and I were uh, here to witness that and we have it on film and uh, uh, he has his certificate and he's back home now, safe and sound. Everything went very well. Uh, so I just wanted to let everybody know out there at Holy Impact Ministries that uh, Brother Mark is uh, safe and is indeed baptized. What a beautiful, beautiful morning. Uh, that we had yesterday. It was just incredible, absolutely incredible. You know, they had said that uh, it was going to be a little bit cloudy in the morning, and it absolutely was not. We got up, the sun was just absolutely blazing out there, and uh, we had some great fellowship, and we had a great baptism, and it was just everything was just absolutely beautiful. We couldn't have asked for a better day. So uh, we just wanted to let you know that that indeed has been uh, mission accomplished uh, as far as uh, that is concerned. So, uh, again, if you uh, see Brother Mark uh, in the chat room, congratulate him on his uh, baptism. Uh, he is all set and ready to go. So I just wanted to, uh, getting back to what we're talking about this evening, um, this is an important study uh, concerning our Father's Torah. And uh, I think that this study will help us maybe better understand our Father's Torah and, and why it was that he implemented the law in the first place. And how do we actually keep the law by faith? And is works really nullified? I mean, is it really all about faith apart from works? Or how does all that work? We're going to talk about all of these things this evening. So we're going to try and clarify a lot of different things. You know, too many of today's modern-day professing Christians simply assume that our Father in Heaven always wanted animal sacrifices to atone for sin in the Old Testament. And, and this has led to a whole host of twisted teachings that have nothing to do with the truth of our Father's Torah. And I want us to understand that. It absolutely has nothing to do with the truth of our Father's Torah. But the truth is that our Father in Heaven never wanted animal sacrifices for the atonement of sin in the first place. Animal sacrifices were put in place through the law to teach man how to have a humble and a contrite heart. Animal sacrifices were put in place through the law so that man would learn the price or the cost of sin. And we're going to talk about some of these things that we find in the Levitical law of our Father here this evening. And I'm going to walk you through several books of what we know today as the Old Testament in order to shine some light on the truth about the different types of various sacrifices that were commanded in our Father's Torah and how they relate to the New Testament and New Testament Christianity today. And so I hope you stay with us this evening as we attempt to unlock and explain how these different types of sacrifices worked in the beginning and why they were put in place in the first place and how they are to be understood today. 
Today, again, is a Monday, July 30th, 2018, and uh, we have one more day left in July of this year, and July's done. It's hard to believe that we are all the way through the month of July, well over half of uh, the, uh, uh, the year is absolutely gone. It is just absolutely gone. It's in the history books, and we are now steaming towards 2019 like a freight train. So uh, I just wanted us to uh, just to kind of reiterate that I just can't believe it. You know, it, as I look through the news articles today and I watch uh, the major events of the world pass by, I can't help but notice how many wars and rumors of wars that we're now hearing about in the news. You know, if it's not North Korea, it's Iran, and if it's not Iran, it's Syria, and if it's not Syria, it's Russia, and if it's not Russia, it's China, and on and on and on. The wars and the rumors of wars continue to be splashed all over of our television screens and our smartphones and our laptops and our iPods and our iPads. Nation is continuously rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There are famines and earthquakes and volcanoes and meteors and sinkholes and huge cracks in the earth and eroding beaches and animal die-offs that are happening each and every day. Day. And all of this is what our Messiah calls birth pains. But I want us to understand what comes after the birth pains. If you read the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew, everything that I've just mentioned is part of what he calls the birth pains. But what happens after the birth pains, according to our Messiah? Have you ever thought about what happens after the birth pains? Because our Messiah stops in Matthew chapter 24, verse 8. And he tells us that these wars and these rumors of wars and kingdoms rising against kingdoms and earthquakes and famines are just birth pains. They're just, in other words, the rumblings of what is to come. And he tells us that the birth pains are the signs of, that would lead up to the Great Tribulation and to a much more difficult time. After Matthew chapter 24, verse 8, our Messiah goes on to say, Then, then, after the birth pains, they will deliver you up to tribulation, to be put to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, my friends, the closest time that we can remember anything like that ever even happening in recent history is the Holocaust. During the Holocaust, they delivered the Jews up to tribulation and they put them to death. And they were hated by all nations because they were God's people. And I want us to think about that for just a moment. We've seen a shadow picture of this not all that long ago. It always amazes me when I hear people proclaim that that'll never happen again. When we can clearly see the signs all around us. Our Messiah tells us that when that happens, and they start delivering us up to tribulation and putting us to death because of his namesake, that many will fall away from the faith, and they will betray one another, and that they will hate one another. My friends, if if you think that the division in your family is tough to deal with now. Wait until they start delivering us up to to tribulation to be put to death. Wait until you're hated by all nations for the sake of the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. If you think that your family has separated themselves from you now, wait until that happens. Our Messiah goes on to tell us that many will fall away and betray one another and that they will hate one another. And so many of those who are within our Christian communities right now will begin to fall away, much like Peter did. And they will begin to hate one another and to betray one another. This is all prophesied. I know that many of us think that we have good, solid Christian assemblies and fellowships that we gather together with at least once a week, and I hope that we do. But the truth is that even many of those who are within our assemblies may fall away. It is written that they will fall away and that they're going to betray one another and hate one another. 
And when they start delivering us up to tribulation, and they start putting us to death because of his namesake, everything's going to change. That's coming, my friends. And we need to not only prepare ourselves for it, but we need to prepare our children and our children's children for it as well. Our Messiah goes on to tell us that there will be many false prophets that will arise and lead many astray. My friends, that's been going on for the last 2,000 years. Today, you have very wealthy wolves in sheep's clothing who have their names and their faces plastered all over billboards and social media and television programs and radio stations that are preaching and teaching a concoction of truth mixed with lies in order to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. We must remember that our Messiah told us very clearly that many would be called, but only few would be chosen. He said, straight is the gate, narrow is the path, and few there would be that would find it. And our Messiah goes on to say something else very profound that the majority of today's professing Christians have been completely blinded to. Our Messiah tells us that because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. How profound a statement is that? Coming from a man who just got done telling us that he did not come to abolish the law or the prophets in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He just got done telling us that not the crossing of a T, not the dotting of an I would pass from his father's law until heaven and earth pass away and all things are accomplished. And we know that none of that happens until Revelation chapter 21. And now, here he is in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, telling us that because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. So, in other words, it is going to be because these wolves in sheep's clothing and these false prophets have come into the world lying to God's people and telling them that God's laws are all nailed to the cross and done away with, that many people's hearts will grow cold. Their hearts will grow cold because of lawlessness. And that because lawlessness has overtaken the world. And I would submit to you, my friends, that we have already seen a glimpse of this happening already today in our time. Already today in our time, people are full of lawlessness because they have been wrongly taught that all of God's laws have been nailed to some tree somewhere, never reading the Bible for themselves, never studying to show themselves approved, never reading the book from the beginning to the end instead of the middle to the end. They are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because they have rejected knowledge. And right after our Messiah tells us that even some of our own brothers and sisters are going to fall away and betray one another and hate one another because of these false prophets that will arise to lead them astray and because lawlessness will be increased, that the love of many will grow cold, he says something else extremely striking. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, verse 13, he tells us, and I quote, But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Let me ask you this, my friends. If I'm, if I'm going to be rescued in a pre-tribulation rescue, then what do I have to endure? If I'm once saved, always saved, so it really doesn't matter how I live or what I do, then... What do I have to endure? If do as thou wilt is now the whole of the law for me because I, uh, I live in some man-made dispensational state of grace apart from God's law, then what do I have to endure? Food for thought. In order to clearly understand how we got to where we are in the world today, I would submit to you that we have to go back to the beginning. In order to understand how and why the world is in the position that it is in today, we must first read the beginning of the book in order to know who our Father in Heaven truly is and what it is that He truly expects from the children that He created. 
One of the first things that we need to understand as Christians is that according to the Bible, there is indeed more than one God. And I know that shocks many Christians to know and to understand that there is more than one God in the Bible. But the biblical fact is is that it's the truth. The fact that there is more than one God comes directly out of the pages of your Bible. According to our god read scripture, there is the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything seen and unseen. But there is also what is known as the little g God of this world. And you can find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. You can also find other gods mentioned in the Bible in Psalms chapter 82. And so it's important for us to once again take possession of the truth and to study to show ourselves approved and to know and to understand who these other gods are and how they became established. And it's also important for us to understand that the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob stands far and above all of these other little g gods that are mentioned in our God-breathed scripture. Man has given dominion to the little g-god of this world. Our Father in Heaven didn't give dominion over to the, uh, over the earth to the devil. Man gave the devil dominion over the earth because man decided to bow his knee to the creature rather than the creator. And because man had freely chosen to do this, Our Father in Heaven was forced to establish His written law with His people. This law that our Father in Heaven established was put in place as a schoolmaster, or a teacher, if you will, to once again reteach the children of God what sin is. Now, this can all be a little bit complex to understand. But I want us to know and I want us to understand that this is why Yahuwah put forth his law. And we're going to prove that and we're going to show that to you. And we're going to take a short break here for just a minute. But before we do, I want us to uh, go to Genesis chapter 3. And I'd like us to make a note of exactly what our Father in Heaven told the serpent in the garden when he, de- when he deceived Adam and Eve with the, the fruit of the tree of good and evil. Now, this was the punishment that Yahovah promised the devil back in the garden. Let's go take a look very quickly. I just want us to go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, so that we can all see this together. Because this all plays into what we're going to be talking about here very shortly. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It says this. It says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, again, Yahovah is speaking to the serpent in the garden because he tricked Eve. He says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It should be clear in every Christian's mind that there is indeed the seed of God and the seed of the devil himself that walks upon the face of the earth today. The one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has offspring that walks on the face of the earth today, and so too does the devil himself have seed that walks upon the face of the earth today, according to our God-breathed scripture. And so, with that in mind, when we come back, we're going to dive into the purpose of of what is known as the Law of Moses. What is the purpose of the Law of Moses, also known as the Law of God? And we're going to attempt to understand the meaning and the purpose of his law and why it's important that this law should be written in the hearts and in the minds of every modern-day Christian today. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Died and rose again, exalted to 
your side Pouring out the Spirit to empower us to shine With nature so divine All the fullness of the Godhead Dwelling in Christ's body the sons of God, having precious promises, we cleanse our spirit and our flesh, making perfect holiness within the fear of God. Jesus died and rose again, exalted to your side, pouring out the Spirit to empower us to shine with nature so divine. Holy seed, impart in me your holiness divine. Through the sonship and the stripes, your is mine, your nature so divine. Holy seed, impart in me your holiness divine. Through the sonship and the stripes, your holiness is mine, your nature so Hello and welcome once again back to the House of David radio program. I'm Pastor Scott Villain with HolyImpactMinistries.com and we're talking about our Father's Torah and the Levitical law that was put forth and what many of us wrongly understand to be in the Old Testament. And that's a mouthful right there, but we'll get into that as we move forward here this evening. As we've just said before the break, it's important for every modern-day Christian to know that there are indeed other gods mentioned in the Bible. The God of this world is indeed Satan, the devil, according to our God-breathed scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 calls the devil himself the little g, God of this world. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, he's called the prince of the power of the air. John calls him the ruler of this world in John chapter 12, verse 31. This title that Paul and John give to Hasatan the devil are given to him because of the major influence that the devil has on the ideals and the opinions and the goals and the hopes and the views of the majority of mankind here on earth. All of the theologies and the denominational dogmas and the philosophical understandings of today's false religions are all under his control, including, but not limited to, Many so-called Christian theologies, dogmas, and philosophical understandings. Let's be clear. If it is not found in the Word of God, then it is not of the Word of God. Things like the first day of the week, Sunday Sabbath, that is not found anywhere in the Word of God, not commanded by any prophet, by any priest, by any apostle, or by any heaven-sent angel, not commanded by the only begotten Son of God, and certainly not commanded by the Father, simply does not exist in the Word of God, and is therefore a lie. Things like Good Friday that are not found anywhere in our Bibles, and are not commanded by any prophet, or by any priest, or by any apostle, or by any heaven-sent angel, and certainly not commanded by the only begotten Son of God, and certainly not commanded by His Father, simply does not exist in the Bible, and therefore is a lie. Our Messiah died on Passover day. According to our god breathed Scripture, read Matthew chapter 26, verse 2, and study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the Word of God, so that you can know the truth and so that you can test the fruits of these wolves in sheep's clothing that are standing behind today's modern-day pulpits. And if you don't already know these things, please take the time to visit us at HolyImpactMinistries.com. Everything we do there is absolutely free, including the downloadable PDF files. 
Let us minister to you. Let us put some truth in your hearing and let us take you by the hand and walk you through the scriptures so that you can know and understand these things as well and use these teachings as a springboard into your own investigation. My point in all of this is that this is how the devil became the little g-god of this world. It's important that we understand that the god of this world only rules over his people. The little g-god of this world does not rule over the people of the god of Israel. Those who believe in Yeshua HaMashiach and know that he is indeed the only begotten Son of God are not under the rule of Satan according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Unbelievers, on the other hand, have indeed been caught in the snare of the devil according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26. According to John chapter 5, verse 19, John tells us, and I quote, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. What today's modern-day Christian needs to understand is that the devil has power over the flesh, but he does not have power over the spirit unless we freely give it to him. I oftentimes use the analogy of, uh, of these old vampire movies. You know, according to the old vampire movies, which are once again taken from pagan and demonic traditions, rituals, and myths, the vampire cannot enter your home unless you invite him in. Where do you think they got that from? It's the exact same way with demons and principalities and cosmic powers and spiritual forces of evil that we war against every day. They cannot come into our temples unless we invite them in. The problem is that most modern-day Christians leave the door wide open. When we're filling our eyes and our ears and our brains with movies and music and video games that have been designed for exactly that purpose, we are inviting these spirits into our temples and into our homes. Many young teenage girls now think that it's attractive and inviting to make love with a dead person, also known as a vampire, because our entertainment industry has created these mythical ideas and dreams for our young daughters and splashed them across the giant silver screen, embedding these images into their thoughts and into their minds and into their dreams. What today's modern-day Christian needs to understand is that the flesh is not what gets us into his coming kingdom. Too many people are worried about what color their skin is. Too many people are worried about what tribe that they think they're from. Too many people worry about whether or not they're Jewish. Too many people are worried about what their DNA sample says. Too many people are, are, are put too far too much stock in the flesh. But I want us to understand that the Apostle Paul taught us about the flesh. And I want us to understand what he said about the flesh. Let's turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. Again, we're going to turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. And I I just want everybody to read this, and I want to put this in everyone's hearing. It says this. It says, For those who who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it can't. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of the Messiah does not belong to him. But if the Messiah is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. My friends, I can't believe how many modern-day Christians have no concept of this teaching. 
According to the Apostle Paul, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. What does that mean? The Apostle Paul tells us very clearly that if you set your mind on the flesh, on the body, the flesh will lead you to nothing but what? Death. The pit. If you're watching vampire movies or pornography or the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, these Texas Chainsaw Massacre flicks, then that's what your heart and your mind are going to be full of. And those fleshly things will lead you down into the pit. They lead to death. Paul goes on to tell us that those who set their minds on the Spirit will find life and peace. And I want us to clearly understand what Paul says about the law of God and the flesh. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7, the Apostle Paul tells us that the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Why? The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God because it doesn't submit to God's laws. Why doesn't it submit to God's laws? Because it can't. The flesh can't do it. If your mind is set on the flesh, then there's no way that you can submit to God's law. And therefore, according to the Apostle Paul, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Why? Because they do not submit to God's law, says the Apostle Paul. You just can't get any more clearer than that, my friends. Once again, that's Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, for those of you who are writing these scriptures down and who want to make note of these things. Paul goes on to tell the church at Rome that they are not in the flesh, but that they are in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in them. Paul says that anyone who does not have the Spirit of the Messiah does not belong to the Messiah. But if, and that's a mighty big word, my friends, the word if, that little two-letter word is much bigger than you think, if, if the Messiah is in you, Then the body is dead because of sin, and the spirit is life because of righteousness. But what does today's modern-day version of Christianity say? Today's modern-day version of Christianity says that all of God's laws are nailed to the cross, so you don't have to be bothered with them. You're once saved, always saved. So in other words, do as thou wilt is the whole of the law for you, because you're once saved, always saved. So it really doesn't matter how you live anyway. This doctrine, my friends, comes directly from the little g God of this world and not from the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Today's modern-day version of Christianity is all about the flesh. It's all about being once saved, always saved, so that you can pretend that do as thou wilt is now the whole of the law for you. But our God-breathed scriptures tell a much different story. According to our God-breathed scriptures, your flesh leads to death. So all of you would-be brothers and sisters out there who are so caught up in the color of your skin or worldly things or what tribe that you think you're from or what part of the world that you think you're from or what your DNA test tells you, you need to wake up and you need to understand that your flesh leads to death. Your flesh is going to die along with the pigmentation of your skin and the color of your hair and the color of your eyes and your stature and your tribal history and all of that is going back to the dust of the earth and will never be heard from again. Now I want to turn to Romans chapter 9 verses 6 through 8 because all of this is going to come to a culmination but we need to get through these things before we get to uh, the more uh, lengthy things in the Torah. So before we get to that I want us to turn to Romans chapter 9 verses 6 through 8. We're going to go to Romans chapter 9 verses 6 through 8 and I want to read this together starting with Romans chapter 9 verse 6. It says but it is not as though the word of God has failed For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham just because they're his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise 
are counted as offspring. My friends, if you want to follow after the flesh and you want to live a once saved, always saved, do as thou wilt is the whole of the law type of lifestyle, then you are making yourself the seed of Satan and you are removing yourself from the seed of the woman and a child of the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you're reading all kinds of historical books in order to try to prove your agenda, if you're trying, if you're tying yourself together with men who are tying themselves to the flesh in any way, then you are being deceived. Not all are the children of Abraham just because there is offspring. Our God breathed scripture is very clear. It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of Yahovah, but the children of the promise that are counted as his offspring. Which leads us right back to our Father's Torah. Do we overthrow the law by this faith that we have in our Messiah? That's an interesting question, considering the fact that the Apostle Paul already asked that question and answered it all in the book of Romans, in one sentence. I'd like us to turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 31, for those of you who are not aware of the teachings of the Apostle Paul and have been lied to and told that the Apostle Paul is taught against the law of God. Romans 3, verse 31. What does Paul say? He asks that question. He says, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? He says, By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. And there's a whole teaching that we could get into concerning exactly what it is that the Apostle Paul taught concerning the law. But it is tectonically important for us to understand that the Apostle Paul never taught against the law of God anywhere in the New Testament. And those who preach and teach that he did preach against the law of God should be ashamed of themselves. According to the word of God, the Apostle Paul always lived in observance of the law. And if you don't believe that, then I suggest you go read Acts chapter 21, verse 24. And while you're at it, you might also want to read Romans chapter 2, verse 13, or Romans chapter 7, verse 12, or Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, or Romans chapter 8, verse 7 and 8, and I could go on and on and on and on. Our Messiah moved the penalty of the law, the penalty of the law, out of the way, by nailing the penalty of the law to the cross for those who would believe in him. He did not nail the law of God to the cross. That is not found anywhere in the 66 books of your Bible. And for people to preach and teach such a thing is simply a lie. As we drill down through our Father's Torah, we will understand very clearly that the new covenant is nothing more than a revitalization of the Old Covenant. Too many modern-day Christians believe that our Father in Heaven only started grafting Gentiles into the house of Israel when Peter had the dream about a sheet full of animals and when he went to the house of Cornelius the centurion. My friends, nothing could be farther from the truth. And when you read the whole book instead of just half of it, you will then know and understand that there is no possible way that anyone could come to such a twisted conclusion. Our Father in Heaven was grafting Gentiles into the house of Israel clear back in the book of the, the book of Exodus. And if you don't believe that he was grafting Gentiles into the house of Israel back in uh, the Old Testament, then I challenge you to go read Exodus chapter 12, verses 48 and 49. And while you're at it, Go read Numbers chapter 15, verse 14 through 16. And when you're done there, go read Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 21 through 23. Need I go on? And I don't want to make this another study about how the Gentiles were being grafted into the house of Israel from the very beginning of the Bible back in what many of us wrongly call the Old Testament. Because we have literally hundreds of hours of teachings on this particular topic at our website. Again, you can visit us at holyimpactministries.com for more information on that. But I do want us to understand, without a shadow of a doubt, that our Father in Heaven speaks, when He speaks something into fruition, it becomes law 
forever. It absolutely changes the dynamics of the universe. When our Father in Heaven says something, when He speaks something into fruition, it cannot be erased, my friends. And especially when He tells us that it is a law that is to be, and I quote, Olam, forever. Our Father in Heaven is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He does not change hats. He does not treat people differently throughout different dispensations of time. He does not have a law that's good in the beginning and then a law that He erases during our time only to reestablish that law when His Son returns. That is not who our Father is, and that is not His character, nor is it His nature, nor is it His eternal way. Nor is it the pattern of our Father in Heaven who continuously works in patterns and in cycles in order to show His children who He is. Our Father in Heaven does things in patterns so that we will learn them. Our Father in Heaven does things in cycles so that we will remember them. Every one of our Father's feast days represents something that has to do with His plan of salvation. The spring feast days were all fulfilled by His first coming. Our Messiah was the Passover Lamb, not our Easter Ham. He died on Passover Day. He was in the earth for three days and for three nights, just as He said He would be in His own red-letter words in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Not two days and two nights, the way the Roman Catholic Church tells us. Our Messiah went into the earth unleavened and without sin during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was raised on first fruits so that he could wave the sheave offering, signaling the new incoming harvest and the first fruits of that new harvest. And when he finally did ascend into heaven to sit at the right hand of his father, his father released his Ruach HaKodesh upon his people to lead them and to guide them in his ways and his commandments and his precepts and his laws. The fall feast days will all be fulfilled when our Messiah returns. The day of trumpets will announce His coming. The day of atonement represents the judgment. The feast of tabernacles will be fulfilled when He finally tabernacles with us here on earth and takes back what it rightly belongs to Him. My friends, before we start talking about the offerings and the sacrificial law, I want us to understand that the new covenant is all about our Father in heaven writing His laws in our hearts and on our minds. And we simply cannot move forward in this study until we understand that basic biblical fact clearly and unequivocally. And so before we move forward, I want to take you very quickly through a few scriptures here just so that you can understand that the New Covenant is indeed nothing more than a reestablishment and a redefining of God's original covenant with His children regardless of what some wolf in sheep's clothing standing behind today's modern-day denominational pulpit may try to tell you. Once again, if we want to know the truth, we need to turn to our Father's God-breathed scriptures. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. Very quick, just a quick sentence here. I just want to read this. Again, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. Let's read what this new covenant is all about very quickly. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahovah. I will put my law within them, and I'll write it on their hearts. And I'll be their God, and they'll be my people. Clearly, without a doubt, our Father in heaven says that he's going to write his laws in the hearts of his people in the Old Testament. Does he say that in the New Testament? You bet he does. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. Very quickly, we're going to bounce over to the New Testament, coming out of the Old Testament, going into the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. Let's read this together. It says this. It says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds... Then, notice, my friends, get that. Then, after he writes his laws in our hearts and in our mind, then he says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. That's in the New Testament, my friends. Exactly what we read that the New Covenant was in the Old Testament. Let's also turn to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. 
We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 8, staying in the book of Hebrews, just going to go to chapter 8, verse 10. What does it say? It says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahovah. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I want us to understand that our Father in heaven, what, what our Father in heaven said to the prophet Isaiah. Let's bounce back to the Old Testament and let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21. Starting with Isaiah chapter 59, verse 21. It says, And as for me, this is my covenant with them. Let's read that again. As for me, this is my covenant with them. What covenant is this? This is the new covenant. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says Yahovah. My spirit that is upon you, and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of shall or, or shall not depart out of your mouth, or out of the mouth of your offspring, or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says Yahovah, from this time forth and forevermore. So let's read that again. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or the mouth of your children, children's offspring, says Yahuwah, from this time forth forevermore. Our Father in heaven once again tells his children that his laws and his words that he has spoken belongs to them. It's in their mouths. For how long? He says forever which is the Hebrew word olam. Our Father in heaven does not say just until my son comes. He doesn't say just until I change my mind. He doesn't say until I make a new covenant with you. He says, and I quote, olam forever. The words that Yahovah speaks are to be in our hearts and in our minds and in our mouths. Again, read the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And these are the exact same words that he uses to command us to keep his Sabbaths. Not just until the sun comes, not just until he changes his mind, not until man decides to create for himself a new dispensation of time. He says, and I quote, forever. And anyone who says that he does not say forever, quite simply, is what? A liar. And just as it is written, my friends, as far as I am concerned, let God be true and every man a liar. And just to nail this down tight, my friends, I want us to once again go take a look at what the prophet Ezekiel had to say about this new covenant that Yahuwah would make with his people. We can find that in Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 through 20. We're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 19 and 20, starting with Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. It says, And I will give them one heart and a new spirit. I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. My friends, I don't care how you cut it. I don't care how you choose to twist the writings of the Apostle Paul. I don't care what denominational empire of dirt that you worship in. I don't care what flesh and bone man that you've made your personal God. According to our God breathed scriptures, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, our Father in Heaven's new covenant is about writing His laws in our hearts and in our minds. Read them and weep. This is so tectonically important for us to understand as we set up this, uh, this particular teaching. Now, we're going to take just uh, a little bit of a short break here. And uh, when we come back in just a few minutes, we're going to talk about why our Father in Heaven never wanted animal sacrifices even in the Old Testament. Why did our Father in Heaven never want animal sacrifices even in the Old Testament? And we'll get back into that in just a few minutes. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Praise the Lord, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name. Let's 
us his name from this time forth and forevermore. Who is like the Lord of God who dwells on high, who humbles himself Welcome back to the House of David radio program. I'm Pastor Scott Blaine with HolyImpactMinistries.com, and we're talking this evening about the schoolmaster, which is our Father's Torah. Now, as we've already stated, our God-breathed scripture is very clear concerning the New Covenant and what the New Covenant was all about. The New Covenant is all about our Father in Heaven writing His law, in our hearts and in our minds. We've seen that in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33 in the Old Testament, and we've seen it again in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 in the New Testament. We've also seen it in Hebrews chapter 8, verse uh, 10. And we can see that this new covenant of the law being written in our hearts and in our minds was brought to us through the blood of our Messiah in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, where our Messiah says in his own red-letter words, and I quote, For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. You can also find that in Luke chapter 22, verse 20. 
We can also find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, and all throughout our God-breathed Scripture. And so at this point in time, I want us to get down to what the law of God truly was meant to be in the first place. Why does our Father want to write His laws in our, in, in our hearts and in our minds so badly? Our Father in Heaven wants to write His laws in our hearts and in our minds for a reason. He created His law to be a schoolmaster, a teacher, if you will. And this is exactly why our Messiah was said to be the Word of God made flesh. What is the Word of God? The Word of God is the law of God. Ask any Jew what the Word of God is, and he'll clearly tell you that the Word of God is the law of God. It is his Torah, his instruction. The law itself is a teacher that was set in place because of the sins of man. The law of God was set in place to teach man the difference between sin and righteousness, between good and evil, between righteousness and wickedness. It was simply put in place to teach us and to protect us from sin. According to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and it is righteous and good. According to James, who was the brother of our Messiah and the head of the Jerusalem council, he tells us in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 25, that the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, will be blessed in his doing. Which is the same thing that we see once again in the Torah. Once again, my friends, none of these apostles ever taught against the law of God anywhere in the New Testament. Men will twist and turn the scriptures inside and out and do all kinds of theological and philosophical gymnastics to try and shun the law of the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They have eyes that do not see and ears that cannot hear. They produce these men out of these colleges like cookie cutters, my friends. And they introduced them into the world, teaching exactly what they taught them. They walk the same, they talk the same, they preach the same. The scripture warns us against listening to such men. Our own Messiah tells us in his own red letter words in Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. He says, and I quote, This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, that says you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. We were warned to be on the lookout for these wolves in sheep's clothing. We were warned that these kinds of men were going to creep into our Christian assemblies. Very quickly, I want us to just go over Jude chapter 1, verse 4. Jude chapter 1, verse 4. Let's read that. What does it say? A warning. Again, Jude chapter 1, verse 4. What does it say? For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach. And so I bring this to your attention so that you will know that we have indeed been warned. We've been warned all throughout. I could just, I, we could spend probably a week just going through all the places in the Bible from the beginning to the end of the 66 books, how many times we've been warned about this. The problem is that we have not taken heed We don't listen to the warnings. We blindly follow after any man that just happens to be standing behind a pulpit. This was never intended for God's people. And if we are true Christians who truly have picked up our crosses and are truly following him, then we will obey his commandments to study to show ourselves approved so that we can test the fruit of the man standing behind the pulpit. My friends, if you're not testing the fruit of the man standing behind the pulpit, then you are doing yourself no service. You are doing your Messiah no service. 
You are doing our Father in heaven no service, and you are doing your children and your children's children no service. And so I want us to understand that the law of God was put forth as a teacher. Paul calls the law a schoolmaster. And with that in mind, knowing in a nutshell what I've just proclaimed to you over about the past hour, and having that information under our belts, we're now prepared to move forward in understanding how to keep the law by faith rather than keeping it by works, and and exactly why our Father put it into place. I want us to understand that the reason that the Israelites did not attain righteousness through the law is not because the law would not teach them how to obtain righteousness. The reason that the Israelites did not attain righteousness through the law was because they were keeping it incorrectly. They were keeping the law by works rather than keeping the law by faith. For more information on that, you can go to Romans chapter 9, verses 30 through 33. The Pharisees, including the Apostle Paul, had memorized every word of the Torah which is also known as the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They literally memorized every single solitary word of the Torah. And yet, and yet, with all that in their brains, they could not recognize their Messiah when he was standing right there in front of them, speaking to them. Our Messiah was prophesied by Moses, He was prophesied all through the Torah. And yet these Pharisees and these scribes didn't even recognize their own Messiah when he was standing right there in front of them. Why? Because they were too busy keeping the law by works rather than keeping it by faith. They were too busy keeping the letter of the law. My friends, anybody can memorize Scripture. A minor bird can memorize scripture. A parakeet can memorize scripture. Any bird brain can memorize scripture. But only a chosen child of Yahovah who is spirit-filled can understand the scripture. Don't think that just because someone can rattle off scripture on a dime that that means that they understand that scripture, that they're mimicking and regurgitating. This is a huge mistake made by many Christians. Any village idiot can memorize and regurgitate Scripture. But not any village idiot can explain the Scripture found in the Bible. Moving on to biblical sacrifices and offerings. I want us to understand that there are various sacrifices found in In the Torah, there are basically five main types of sacrifices or or offerings that can be found in the Torah. There are burnt offerings, there's the grain offering, there's the peace offering, there's the sin offering, offering, and the trespass offering. And those are the basic five types of offerings or or, uh, sacrifices that there are. Each of these offerings involved either animals or the fruit of the field. And they were commanded to be... uh, uh, or they were commanded to represent a specific purpose. Most of these offerings were split into several portions. There was God's portion, and then there was the portion for the Levites or the priests who had no inheritance, and then there was a portion, oftentimes for the uh, kept by the person offering the sacrifice. These sacrifices or offerings were categorized as either voluntary or sometimes mandatory offerings. The sacrifice or the offering that I want to speak about today is the sin offering. And the reason that I want to talk about the sin offering is because if we understand the sin offering properly, we will better understand not only all the rest of the offerings, but we'll, I believe that we'll also better understand the rest of the Torah as well. The first thing that I want us to understand is that our Father in Heaven never had any interest in the sacrificial sin offering. Now, that may surprise a lot of us, but according to our god breathed scripture, it's just simply the truth. Yahuwah, the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, never desired a, sacrifice, a sacrificial sin offering of animals. Now, how do we know that? How can I say that? Once again, it's called reading the book from the beginning and not from the middle. 
I'd like us to start out by reading several Old Testament scriptures as well as some New Testament scriptures that can be found throughout the writings of both the prophets and the apostles. The first scriptures that I'd like us to turn to uh, can be found in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11 through 20. So we're going to turn to Isaiah chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 11 through 20, starting with Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. And it says this, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says Yahovah? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not. Listen, your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says Yahovah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, get that, my friends. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of Yahovah has spoken. Once again, my friends, I want us to understand that these laws were put into place to teach us the cost of sin. They were put in place to teach us why it's important to humble ourselves and to have a contrite heart. It was never about the sacrificing of animals for the atonement of sin. It was about teaching men not to sin in the first place and why he didn't want to sin. Our Father in Heaven tells us very clearly that if we will simply wash ourselves and make ourselves clean and remove the the evil deeds, our evil deeds from before His eyes and stop doing evil, and if we will learn to do good and to seek justice and to correct oppression and to bring justice to the fatherless and to plead the widow's cause, that our scarlet-colored sins will be turned white as snow. My friends, I'm telling you the truth when I tell you that nothing has changed to this very day. Nothing has changed between that covenant and the new covenant. How do we make ourselves clean? How do we remove our evil deeds from before our Father's eyes? How do we cease to do evil? How do we learn to do good? How do we seek justice? How do we correct oppression? How do we bring justice to the fatherless? How do we plead the widow's cause? By keeping his law. By keeping his precepts and his appointments and his Sabbaths. Not to earn something, but because we love him. If we allow the Bible to define the Bible, then we should already know what the definition of sin is. What is the biblical definition of sin? According to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. Therefore, you cannot have sin without the law. Because the biblical definition of sin is the transgression of the law. Our Father in Heaven never wanted animal sacrifices and grain offerings. Let's turn to the New Testament And let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 6. Again, we're going to go, we're going to jump up into the New Testament, into the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, 
And we're going to read verses 4 through 6, starting with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. It says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Do we understand that? It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when the Messiah came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. My friends, I want us to understand, and and this really shouldn't be all that hard if we just use a little bit of God-given common sense. God did not sin against man. Man sinned against God. Therefore, man had to make a sacrifice to God. And that sacrifice had to be a man. The idea of the animal sacrifice was to teach us that the only way that sin can be dealt with, can be atoned for, is through the innocent. An innocent man had to come. When our Father in Heaven called Abraham to take his son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him there, it was something that our Father in Heaven wanted to use to test Abraham. And Abraham passed that test. But he wasn't going to let Abraham do it. Right when Abraham raised up that knife, and right when Abraham was about to kill Isaac, and and Yahovah knew in Abraham's heart that he was going to do it, he stopped him immediately. And he provided a ram for him. Our Father in Heaven was not going to allow Abraham to do what our Father in Heaven was ultimately going to do. He knew that pain. You see, he'd already been there and he'd already done it. Our Father in Heaven is outside of time. This is how he can prophesy. This is how he he knows what happens before it happens. Our Father is not confined by time, space, and matter. He sees the whole parade from the beginning to the end. And he was not going to allow his servant Abraham to go through the pain that he himself was about to take upon himself by providing his own son as a sacrifice. It's tectonically important that we who have the law of God written in our hearts and in our minds, we who have picked up our crosses and are following our Messiah and are doing as he did and living as he lived, understand that our Father in Heaven never desired animal sacrifices. It was never about animal sacrifices. It was about helping man to understand the importance of the obedience to God. Hosea says it very well and very clearly in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. Let's turn there very quickly. Just one sentence here. What is it? What does Hosea say? Because he says it so clearly, and I think it's better understood. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, starting with Hosea 6, verse 6, he says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Love, my friends, is synonymous with faith. Today's modern-day Christian no longer associates faith with love or love with faith. Today's modern-day professing Christian has been lied to and wrongly taught that faith simply means to run around like a parakeet, just reciting the words, I believe, I believe, I believe. But what does our Messiah say? Our Messiah said the same thing in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, that Isaiah said in chapter 29, verse 13. He said in his own red-letter words that this people honors him with their lips, but their heart is far from him. He said, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. 
these men who are flying around the world in their personal jets and driving around in their big black Denali's wearing three-piece Armani suits with their patent leather shoes and their $500 haircuts and their leather-bound Bibles don't have a clue. They honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. They have made void the word of God in order to hold on to their own man-made traditions. Claiming to be wise, they have become fools. They have become whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, full of dead men's bones and all kinds of iniquity. They are indeed a brood of vipers. They travel over land and sea to make one believer, and when he becomes a believer, he winds up becoming a twofold child of hell, more so than they are. If you think for one second that the majority of today's modern day pastors, priests, bishops, and popes are any different than the Pharisees and the scribes of our Messiah's time, please, please, my friends, read your Bible. Study to show yourself approved. Ask, seek, and knock, and the door will be open to you. Stop going to your weekly country club on the wrong day of the week and allowing some wolf in sheep's clothing that you barely know to wrongly program you and your children not to read the first half of the book because it's all been nailed to the cross, according to him and his denominational empire of dirt. Stop feeding the beast. Stop bowing your knee to the creature rather than the creator. Stop kissing the golden pagan ring of a harlot that sits on a golden throne who drinks and feeds on the very blood of the martyrs of our Messiah. Understand the truth of God's word and the importance of his law that he's trying to desperately write on your heart and in your mind so that he can give you the hope of salvation through the blood of his only begotten son who came to teach and preach his father's Torah, who was the very word of God and the very law of God made flesh. You see, it's all about understanding the law, not memorizing the law. It's all about understanding our Father in heaven and what he truly wants and expects from his children that he created. I want us to understand that what King David understood concerning our Father in heaven. I'd like us to turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 51, verses 16 and 17. Again, we're going to turn to the book of Psalms, again, in chapter 51. And we're going to go to verses 16 and 17, starting with Psalms chapter 51, verse 16. It says, and again, this is when uh, uh, King David, this is a psalm that King David wrote when he made the mistake of taking Bathsheba as uh, a wife and killing her husband Uriah. This is what uh, the, uh, uh, this is what King David says to Yahovah. Starting with, uh, again, Psalms 51, verse 16, it says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. You see, my friends, our Father in heaven never desired sacrifice or, or grain offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and a broken and contrite heart. Not according to me, but according to our God-breathed scriptures and the very man who our Messiah came from, King David. And if you do not know that our Messiah came from the loins of King David, you need to go read 2 Samuel chapter 7 and study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of God so that you can understand how important that these words in Psalms 51 really are. You see, understanding why it is that God wrote his law is how we properly keep God's law. It's not by continuing to give sacrifices and offerings and all of these types of things. He doesn't want those things. He wants our hearts. He wants our love and our obedience because we love him, not because we're trying to earn something from him. 
Now, of course, we know that we do not sacrifice animals for the atonement of sin any longer because our Messiah was indeed our Passover lamb and the last sacrifice needed for the sins of man. But this does not nullify the teaching of the atonement for sin. This does not erase the law of the atonement for sin. For those who do not believe in the Messiah and the hope of salvation that he has brought to the world, the sacrificial law for atonement still stands because they have made the law a God in of itself. And this is what the Apostle Paul was trying to tell the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jewish people of Yeshua's time. He wasn't saying that the law was abolished or done away with or nailed to a cross. Paul was simply trying to tell them that the penalty of the law that was against us, was the law against us? No, the law was never against us. The penalty of the law was... What is sin again? Sin is the transgression of the law. What's the penalty for sin? What's the penalty for transgressing the law? Death. The wages of sin is death. That's what was against us. Paul was simply trying to tell them that the penalty of the law was against us, had been moved out of the way for us, if we would simply accept the fact that Yeshua HaMashiach, who we are all guilty of sacrificing, by the way, was indeed our Passover lamb and the last sacrificial atonement for sin. And with that in mind, I want us to understand something else very critical for those modern-day professing Christians out there who claim that they did not have any part in sacrificing our Messiah. I cannot tell you how tired I am of hearing such blasphemous things. Your sins have not been atoned for. If you're claiming that you had no part in the sacrifice of our Messiah, then you are claiming no no, no responsibility for that sacrifice, which means that you still owe a sacrifice for the atonement of your sin. And so before we get all high and mighty pointing at the Jews and claiming that it was the Jews that sacrificed their Messiah and not we perfect Gentiles, we need to wake up. We need to realize the demonically inspired garbage that we're proclaiming. In order for our sins to be cleansed, we have to have a sacrifice, a human sacrifice. And so for us to reject all responsibility for that sacrifice, we are therefore rejecting our Messiah and are therefore outside of the will of God and without an offering for our sin. Wake up, my friends. Your sins are not forgiven because you are denying your responsibility in that sacrifice. Wake up. My friends, this is the difference between keeping the law by works and keeping the law by faith. Faith is synonymous with love. Always, always remember that you can't separate them. The problem that today's modern-day professing Christian has is that they disconnect faith and love. They believe that faith is simply saying that they believe with their lips. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That's lip service, my friends. He doesn't want that. That is not taught anywhere within the confines of the 66 books of our Bibles. Faith without works is dead, People who wrongly run around proclaiming that Abraham was saved by faith apart from works because that's what some unstudied pastor told them who should have spent more time studying his Bible than preaching need to wake up. According to the book of James, chapter 2, Abraham was justified by works when he offered his son Isaac up on the altar. Abraham's faith was active along with his works. Abraham's faith was completed by his works. And it was Abraham's faith that was completed by the works that he did. James, who was the brother of our Messiah and the head of the Jerusalem council, tells us very clearly in James chapter 2, verse 24, that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. James chapter 2, verse 17 tells us that faith by itself, if it does not have works is dead. If you want to truly know why it was that our Father in Heaven even chose Abraham to be the father of all nations, 
then you need to take the time to sit down and read his God-breathed scriptures. Let's turn together to Genesis chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. And let's read the truth about how Abraham's faith was completed by Abraham's works. Again, Genesis chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Genesis chapter 26, starting with Genesis chapter 26, verse 4. Yahovah says, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of the heavens, and I will give your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Genesis chapter 26, verse 5. Next verse down. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. That's why. Do not let these wolves in sheep's clothing lie to you and tell you that Abraham was saved by faith apart from works, my friends. Read the book from the beginning to the end instead of from the middle to the end. Ask, seek, and knock, and the door will be opened to you. Study to show yourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of God. Understand the red-letter commandment of our Messiah found in Matthew chapter 23, verses 8 through 12. And I want to read this. I want everybody to turn there right now. Very important, please. Matthew chapter 23, verses 8 through 12. Red-letter commandments from our Messiah that 99 and 9 tenths of of, uh, today's modern-day Christianity can't even recite. Matthew chapter 23, verses 8 through 12. Red letter words comes from the very mouth, the very tongue, the very breath of our Messiah. He says, but you are not to be called rabbi. How many men are running around calling themselves rabbi right now? Rabbi means great one. You are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you're all brothers. And call no man your father on the earth. How many people are doing that? You know who's doing that. Who is it that you have to call father and confess your sins to? Our Messiah says, Call no man on earth your father, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. He's the instructor. If we have any truth, it's him that we got it from. The greatest among you shall be your servant. They shall be serving you. Whoever exalts himself is going to be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted or lifted up. These are the red-letter words that come from your Messiah. Stop listening to the wisdom of men and start listening to the wisdom of Yahovah, given to you through study and the Ruach HaKodesh himself, who is the only one that our Messiah left to teach us and to remind us of what he said. Who is it that our Messiah left in charge according to our God-breathed scripture? Was it Peter? Was it the Pope? Is it a pastor, a priest, a bishop? Was it a flesh-and-bone man? Or was it the Ruach HaKadosh of God? Let's turn to the book of John, chapter 14, verse 26. Again, I want everyone to turn to the book of John, chapter 14, verse 26. Please, John 14, verse 26. Red-letter words comes out of the mouth of our Messiah. We're going to find out who it is that he left to teach us and to remind us of all things. John, chapter 14, verse 26. But the Helper, the Ruach HaKodesh, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. No mention of a pope. No mention of a pastor or a priest or a bishop. No mention of a golden throne or a golden ring to kiss. No mention of an indulgence to buy. No mention of a church to forgive you of your sin. No mention of a man that you're supposed to call your father. Wake up, my friends. Wake up and spread the good news. And I don't mean man's good news. I'm not talking about the false good news of man and his early church fathers. I'm not talking about the good news of the God of this world and his false harlot church. 
I'm talking about the good news of the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, who is the only begotten son of the one true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the rulers of rulers, the God of gods, the creators of the heaven and the earth, the creator of all things seen and unseen, the author of life. I'm talking about the Yahovah, the El Elyon, the Abba Father, the Elohim, the El Shaddai. That's whose good news I'm talking about. That's whose gospel we need to hear. That's the salvation that is the only way, that is the door that no man can shut, that is the crown of glory, that is the race that we need to run. And that's the truth. Praise the God of Israel, Yehoshua, the son of Yah, and the Ruach HaKodesh of Yah, and the heavenly angels and the heavenly host and the heavenly council that serve him. Praise be the children of Yah, who he has created for his good pleasure and his holy word that endures forever and ever. Amen. I cannot just sit here and listen to the ramblings of the world any longer. I cannot sit silent, chained in darkness. I cannot withhold the abundance of light that radiates my life through the truth of my Father and my King and the love that He has for His people. The day will come when I will go silently into that good night. And I will beckon the calling of my Father to the grave. But before I go, I will go with a shout of thunder and the blast of a trumpet and the burst of light that spells out his name across the darkened sky and I will blaze a path of glory to the tree of life that my Messiah has shown me in his mercy and in his grace and in his kindness. And I will dwell there with him all the days of my life from there on out. If you're praising a man named Jesus who did away with his father's law and who came to preach his own word, if you're praising a man named Jesus who came to create a new Sabbath and to celebrate his own birthday, if you're praising a man named Jesus who came to do away with the Passover and the very anniversary of his death and replace it with a man-made pagan myth, if you're praising a man named Jesus who has inv- was invented by the Roman Catholic Church and her daughter Protestant churches and their denominational empires of dirt and their so-called early church fathers, please, please, let me introduce you to Yeshua HaMashiach, who is the one true, only begotten Son of Yahuwah, who came to preach his father's Torah and to do his father's will and not his own, and who was his father's word made flesh, and who came to be an example for us by baptizing himself and by keeping each and every one of his father's feast days himself, and who came to keep the law of his father perfectly as an example to us to show us that we can be perfect just as he is perfect. Go to your prayer closet and face the holy promised land of Jerusalem and bow your head and bend your knee and ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach for the forgiveness of your sins and be baptized in the name of Yahovah and Yeshua HaMashiach, His only begotten Son and the Ruach HaKodesh of God. If you're still worshiping in today's modern-day version of corporate Christianity, You need to know that our Messiah commands us, and I quote, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. The day is short, and the time is at hand, and the sand is leaving the hourglass as we speak. Our Messiah is on His way, and we are closer to His coming kingdom now than when we first believed. Take heed, 
audit your faith, be able to give an account for what you believe, put on the full armor of God that you that you can stand in the evil day, make straight your paths and put on your put your houses in order. Stay sober minded and be vigilant. Remember that you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so let us not sleep as others do. But let us stay awake and be sober. And with that, my friends... I just want to I just want to thank you so very much for spending your evening with me here at the House of David radio program. My hope and my prayer is that we've given you enough to take to your prayer closet and to once again face the holy promised land of Jerusalem and to bow your head and to bend your knee and to ask in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach if the things you've heard here today be true or not. In this fallen Babylonian world that we now live in, it is imperative that we test everything. Once again, my friends, if you would like to support what we're doing here at the House of David radio program uh, and at our website at holyimpactministries.com, you can support us by visiting our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash Holy Impact Ministries. And you can sign up there to sponsor us in the work that we're doing to preach the truth of God's Word to the nations. You can also visit us at uh, our website at holyimpactministries.com and you can click on the uh, donate button or you can send your sponsorship to the address listed there underneath the donate button. Once again, my friends, I just want to thank you so very much for sharing your time with me here this evening. And we will see you next Monday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the House of David radio program. I'm Pastor Scott Villane. Shalom, everyone. Thank you for listening to The House of David. A Holy Impact Ministries.com production where we test the scripture, contend for the faith, stand for the truth. Shalom, everyone. <laughs>